Jasmine here coming at you with another Biggest Losers of the Bible. As we continue to look at these Biggest Losers of the Bible, these people were not perfect. We could place ourselves in the lives of any of these characters. If you're a refugee or if you are an orphan or a widow, you had prostitutes, princesses that were sacrificing children to other gods, devout holy people displaced and hunted, people who were being exiled, crazy situations based on the historical time that they lived in. There clearly is still hope based on all of the stories that we have already explored for Biggest Losers of the Bible. That being said, today we are going to take a look at the prophet Ezekiel. There's something about being home where everything's just right. We're surrounded by people we love and trust. There's a feeling of stability and safety. And while some people get to experience this kind of home, many do not. Others might even be forced to leave their home and go live in a foreign land. We call this going into exile. Yeah, in exile, everything is disoriented. You're in the unknown. And in the story of the Bible, this is where the ancient Israelites found themselves, conquered by Babylon, living in exile far from their homeland. And so they had to ask themselves, how did we end up here? And is there any hope of going home? When Jerusalem and the southern kingdom of Judah were conquered by the Babylonians in 586 BCE, Jews had lost all sovereignty in the land of Israel, the temple was destroyed, and much of the population was either killed or driven into exile. Every level of society, from the poor farmer to the priests and the king, was profoundly disrupted by the Babylonian conquest. First, there were the ten tribes who had lived in the northern kingdom before it was conquered by Assyria. They had been forcefully deported to places where they were separated from their countrymen and made to assimilate with the peoples around them. Some small groups may have left the region altogether for East Asia and Africa, remaining together while also taking on new national identities. In the southern kingdom, the refugees from the Babylonian conquest of Judah included the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, as well as a portion of the Levites. Some went to Egypt, especially the city of Alexandria. The largest number went to Mesopotamia, the birthplace of their ancestor Abraham. The dispersions left the Jews a fragmented people scattered throughout the eastern Mediterranean and Persia. And one of the, the things that people overlook is the timeline. Right here you have all these different prophets, uh, Zephaniah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Jeremiah, Nahum, Obadiah, and Habakkuk, all right here in this time. Look at the timeline. Jeremiah is speaking long before the, the Babylonian captivity. Ezekiel is speaking before it. Obadiah is speaking just before this time. But all these prophets are still talking into the exile, into the captivity, when they're in Babylon. Daniel's there. Ezekiel's there. Jeremiah doesn't go to Babylon, but he keeps on speaking for a while until he just disappears from the story. Habakkuk just before. Obadiah just before. Nahum just before. It's odd how all these guys were all together in the same timeline speaking as they are today. Prophets today, preachers, evangelists are all saying the same thing. There's not just one speaking, but a lot speaking. Hopefully the same thing. Jesus is returning. So the next time you read Ezekiel, remember the story of Ezekiel. Run it through your mind as you're reading it. He's playing this out. He's acting out these things. Ezekiel was a priest who had been living in Jerusalem during the first Babylonian attack on the city. And they spared the city, but they took a first wave of Israelite prisoners and hauled them off into exile, and Ezekiel was among them. So the book begins five years after all that, and Ezekiel is sitting on the bank of an irrigation canal near his Israelite refugee camp, and it's his 30th birthday, no less, the year that he would have been installed as a priest in Jerusalem. And then all of a sudden, Ezekiel has this vision. He sees a storm cloud approaching, and then inside the cloud are four strange creatures that have wings outstretched and touching each other. And these creatures each had four faces. And then he saw four wheels, one by each creature. And then he saw that the wings of the creatures were supporting this dazzling platform. And then on that platform is a throne. And then sitting on that throne is this human-like creature glowing and shrouded in fire. And then all of a sudden Ezekiel realizes what he's seeing.
being. He calls it the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. It's God riding his royal throne chariot. So God first speaks to Ezekiel from the throne chariot. Israel has given their allegiance to other gods and has been worshiping idols, and this has all led to rampant social injustice and violence. And so as a result, God appoints Ezekiel to warn the people. The first Babylonian attack that took Ezekiel into exile is going to be matched by another, and Jerusalem, its temple, all face imminent destruction. So Ezekiel uses words and more to get his message across. He also performs sign acts. These were a form of street theater. Ezekiel would go out in public and start behaving in these really bizarre ways that were like parables of his prophetic message. And perhaps the most disheartening thing of all is the bad news God gave Ezekiel that no one was going to listen to him. Israel would reject him because of their rebellious and hard heart. And after about a year, he has another vision. This one is about the temple. He goes on this virtual tour of the temple, and he sees what's happening there in his absence, and it is not good. In the outer courtyard in front of the temple, he sees this large idol statue. And then he sees the elders of Israel worshiping other gods, both outside and inside the temple. And then he sees the women of Israel. They're worshiping a Babylonian god named Tammuz, and the The vision ends with God's glorious throne chariot moving up and away from the temple. It's leaving, going east, headed towards Babylon. But God hasn't abandoned his people. Rather, he goes into exile with them. And so at the end of this vision in chapter 11, God promises that he will return a remnant of Israel back to the land, and he'll transform them by removing their heart of stone and giving them a new soft heart of flesh. So the next three sections are all announcements of God's judgment, first on Israel, then on the nations around Israel, and then on Jerusalem itself. Uh, In Ezekiel chapter 16, the Lord is going to speak, and many times the scripture will speak specifically to a city. The Lord makes a connection between a city or a land or a region and the people who live there. The point is to simply convey an idea, all right? Look with me in verses 1 and 2 of this chapter, Ezekiel 16, and it says, again, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, make known to Jerusalem her abominations. Well, there you go. That's the purpose of the parable right there. In verse three, he says, and say, thus says the Lord, notice this, to Jerusalem, your origin and your birth are of the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. The Hittites and the Amorites were two of the largest clans of people in all of Canaan. And so it was very common for people to say the Hittites and the Amorites to refer to all of Canaan. That that became an insult to say that someone was a Canaanite. Verse 4, and as for your birth, on the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to cleanse you nor rubbed with salt, wouldn't that have been a great custom to keep going, nor wrapped in swaddling clothes. Notice what the Lord is saying here about Jerusalem. This means something more to the people of the ancient Near East than it does to us. It was a way of legitimizing the birth of the child because you're going to see here in just a moment what they would do if they felt the birth was illegitimate. And the birth could be illegitimate simply because a child was born with birth defects, or, sorry ladies, if it was a girl. Jerusalem is being pictured as having a shameful beginning. And the analogy here is that Jerusalem was born as an unwanted, illegitimate child. In verse five, he says, no, I pitied you to do any of these things, speaking of what they would do to a newborn child, to you out of compassion for you, but you were cast out on the open Field. I want you to take note of that phrase, for you were abhorred on the day that you were born. And um, I'm sorry to say that it was a fairly common practice again in the Near East to, um, to take a child that was unwanted. They wouldn't clean it up. They wouldn't do anything. They would just take it out to a field and let it die of exposure and wild animals and that sort of thing. And that's what the Lord is referring to here concerning Jerusalem, but I want you to notice how the Lord begins to speak of his compassion. He says in verse six, but when I passed by you and saw you wallowing in your blood, 
I said to you, in your blood, live. And then he repeats that. I said to you, in your blood, live. Now, but then after that, the hopeful conclusion of chapter 11 gets developed in the final three sections of the book. First, hope for Israel, then for the nations, and then for all creation. And then a key moment happened in chapter 33. Ezekiel receives a report that the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem is over because the city has fallen. The temple is destroyed. Ezekiel's grim words of warning came true. Tonight, we're going to be going through a couple of chapters here in Ezekiel that are going to be dealing directly with the time of the tribulation and then on into the millennial kingdom. And, and, we're, and you know, you'd say, well, wait a minute, I thought we're in Ezekiel, not Revelation. No, oh, yeah, that's right. We're right here in Ezekiel. And Ezekiel deals a lot prophetically with that time uh, of the tribulation, that seven-year period uh, when God is, is pouring out his wrath upon an unbelieving world and so forth. And uh, we're going to look at that. But before we do, chapter 37 of Ezekiel is uh, all about God's restoration of the, the people Israel. And this idea gets developed in the next strange vision. God tells him that it's an image, a metaphor for Israel's spiritual state. In Ezekiel's vision, the Spirit of the Lord carried him to the middle of a valley filled with dry bones that were scattered all over the place. As the Spirit of the Lord led Ezekiel through this valley of bones, God asked him, Can these bones live again? Ezekiel responded, O oh, Sovereign Lord, only you know the answer to that. Then God told Ezekiel to speak a message of prophecy to the dry bones that surrounded him, saying, Dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. I will put breath into you and make you live again. I will put flesh and skin on you, and you will return to life. When I breathe new life into you, then you will know that I am the Lord. So Ezekiel spoke just as the Lord commanded. And as Ezekiel said the words of God's prophecy, a great rattling sound filled the valley. The bones of each body came together and connected themselves to form complete skeletons. As Ezekiel watched, muscles and flesh formed over the bones, and then skin formed over the bodies. But there was no breath in them. There was no life in these bodies. Then God commanded Ezekiel to speak a prophecy to the winds by saying, Come, O breath, from the four winds. Breathe into these dead bodies that they may live again. As Ezekiel spoke these words, breath came into their bodies, and they all came to life. There in this valley, a vast army of living men stood before Ezekiel. Then God explained to Ezekiel that the bones in the valley represented the people of Israel, dried up out of hope and out of life. Then God told Ezekiel to prophesy to Israel, O oh, my people, I will open your graves and cause you to rise. I will bring you out of captivity and back to the land of Israel. The hope for Israel begins with God promising to raise up a new David, a future messianic king who's going to be the kind of leader that Israel needed but never got. What about the evil that's still rampant out there among the nations? And what about the future of God's dwelling place in the temple? And this is what the final two sections of the book are about. I want to find some people that will stand up and say, you are full of iniquity, you are full of wickedness, you are full of injustice, and we're going to see God judge unless we do something about it. This was the situation that the prophet Ezekiel had to deal with. He sees it in chapter 14. He sees it in chapter 9. But now we come to the main one. God said this in the Exodus plagues. I am going to distinguish a separation between my people and the people of the world or Egypt. And if you still don't see the parallel between exile from the garden and exile from Israel, think about this. In Genesis, humanity's exile led up to the story about the building of what city? Oh yeah, Babylon. The same place the Israelites are sent. But that's not the end of either story. 
yeah, I, I can relate to this. I have a great home, but it's situated in a world scarred with pain and broken relationships, death, tragedy, done by others, but also done by me. And so in the Bible, exile is the human condition. We all keep repeating this pattern of human corruption leading to a Babylon that we can't escape. And it doesn't matter where you live, we are all longing for a better home. Now Israel's scriptures held out hope that one day God would send a king who would rescue the world from all of the Babylons we've created. And after many generations pass, we meet this Israelite named Jesus of Nazareth. He wandered about with no home, announcing the great restoration, that reality of home that Israel and all humanity has been looking for. The real return from exile had begun. And so Jesus' followers remain exiles as they wait for that day when Jesus returns to transform this world into a true home. All right, guys, that is all I have for us today. Ezekiel is very long, convoluted and confusing at times, but it's important that we take the time to learn his story and see what it is that he was saying. This is the only other book that gives us any indication of what actually happened. When Jesus says that he saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning, it's a very important book because it references things in the far past, things that would happen in the near future, as well as the end times future that I suspect we are all living in today. I hope you guys enjoy and do not forget to like, share and subscribe and also you will not find out about these videos if you do not have your notifications on turn on the bell notification let me know what you think in the comments and i cannot wait to see where this takes us next time bye guys